Hello folks, my name is Drew Leonard. Uh, hopefully you've watched the videos leading up to this installment. Uh, we're on lesson four as it pertains to our study in the book of Isaiah. As I've mentioned before, we've got our workbook that goes along with our study, the composition of Isaiah, mystery or manifest, and it just has questions that uh, we'll be going over that will follow the chapters as they are in the book. We've got a book available and now of course we're making these video lectures in order to try to get this material into your hands and uh, a little bit more easily accessed. accessed. Um, so we're following up, we talked about uh, in the last installment, we talked about predictive prophecy and whether or not that's a biblical reality, whether or not it's an historical reality. And the conclusion that we've landed upon is yes, it is. It's real. It's something that does exist. It does occur. And we simply don't know a reason why somebody would object to it. If somebody would object to it, they've got a serious problem in that now they're, re they're, um, they're objecting to the death, burial, and then the resurrection of Jesus Christ. A resurrection from the dead. Did he actually come back from the dead? And if somebody says no, then our, our debate needs to be centered there rather than on the, just the authorship of Isaiah. But what we're seeing as a trend is that a lot of these people who are somehow holding to Christianity, which is based in a supernaturalistic uh, element, they are then also trying to deny other supernaturalistic elements. And we're just simply asking the question, why is that? Is this plausible? Now, maybe somebody should object and say, well, I still don't, I mean, I, I accept miracles, but I still object to Isaiah's writing the text. Well, I think that's a little bit different then than somebody just going ahead and saying, well, I object to the authorship of Isaiah because of predictive prophecy. Miracles don't exist. Now we're talking about an entirely different debate. So I think there is a difference to be made there, but we're in lesson four. Now let's start critiquing some of the things that we've seen. In an earlier lesson, lesson two it was, we looked at the text of Isaiah as viewed through the lens of, of these critical scholars. They're telling us that the book cannot be written by Isaiah as a whole and the reason for that they they believe uh, of course is uh, the reasons are numerous. And so they're going to tell us from Isaiah 13, Isaiah 21, 24 through 27, Isaiah 40 through 48, I, Isaiah 53 and other other passages as well. They're going to say well this obviously says that Isaiah could not write the entire book that bears his name. Is that true or is that not? Now we've already critiqued it a little bit, but let's now start to examine some of these arguments line by line. It is interesting that the Medes are mentioned in Isaiah 13, and to show you that, I want to show you the text as it reads. I'm going to show you our Bible program, and I want us to look at Isaiah 13 together uh, for a brief moment. Take a look at Isaiah chapter 13, and we're going to start out in verse 1. Look at this. It says, the burden of Babylon, the burden of Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos did see. Now, why is that peculiar? Why is that interesting? Well, you've already got Isaiah the son of Amos. So the 8th century figure, so says 13.1, it's saying that he's seeing the burden, the fall, the judgment, the oracle that has been now leveled against Babylon. Well, the critical scholar says, well, that cannot be. Isaiah lives in the 8th century BC. The fall of Babylon would not ultimately occur until the 6th century BC. So if I switch over here to our drawing program for a brief moment, what they're basically saying is this. They're saying here in the 8th century you have Isaiah, but the event talked about in Isaiah 13, 1 is a 6th century event. And so they're saying, obviously, Isaiah could not predict this event in the future, so their naturalistic theology suggests. So what they say is, well, obviously, this is either a late gloss. 13.1 is probably a late gloss. So even though it says here, Isaiah, the son of Babylon, did see it, their conclusion is to say, ah, but truly, truly, Isaiah did not but some later editor placed this snippet in there, which Isaiah the son of Amos did see. We're supposed to read it as though it's from Isaiah's pen, but not really. That's what we're told. And so it's very interesting. It's a very interesting view. That's what the naturalists suggest, though. But it gets more peculiar as we read through this text. Don't have time to read the entire text. That's not the purpose of this course. But as we look through Isaiah chapter 13, he drops down in talking about the judgment upon Babylon, and here's what it says in Isaiah 13 and verse 17. 
Behold, God says, and Isaiah writes this. Now the naturalist says, well, Isaiah didn't write it. This is a light gloss. Okay, perhaps, perhaps. But think about it with me for just a moment. Behold, I will stir up the Medes against them. Against who? Against Babylon. So who's coming against Babylon? Who is? The Medes. The Medes. Now this is very peculiar, and here's why. If, if it is some late editor, some late author, if we go back to our drawing program, if somebody is writing all of this after the fact, here's what we would expect. Thinking about if a late writer put all of this in there for us, um, if a late writer put all of this in here for us, what we would expect is it not to say Medes? No, a late author would actually have said Persians. If an individual wrote this in the sixth century, looking back, if an individual wrote this in the sixth century, looking back after the fall of Babylon, here's Babylon's fall in 539. So let's say this writer writes it just after, maybe this is the year 538. If some author wrote this just after, they would not have capitalized on the Medes. The Medes were not the major force at this time. An historian would have put Persians. So this is very interesting. Let's go back now to our Bible program and let's think about what that might mean. As we go back to our Bible program and we think about what that has to say with Isaiah's text, when he says, Behold, I will stir up the Medes... I will stir up the Medes, perhaps there is something early embedded within that. Why might this be? Let's imagine for a moment that yes, it's a prediction. But what if Isaiah is predicting the fall of Babylon as his present understanding of the historical events around him would be satisfied? What if Isaiah, looking ahead, God tells him Babylon's going to be judged, and God tells him it's going to be judged by the Medo-Persians. What if Isaiah sees the Medes more at, a, at this time as an earlier force? What if the Persians aren't so on the scene at this point? And that, that is very historically fitting, by the way. So maybe it's the case that Isaiah, recognizing the Medes, writes this down. But the fact that it's the Medes and not the Persians denies this idea that it's some late author. If it were some late naturalistic historian writing this after the event, they would have put Persians. They would not have placed Medes there. The fact that it says Medes speaks against that kind of suggestion. And maybe it says something then about the authorship of Isaiah. Maybe it really was a prediction. 200 years, nearly 150 years in advance. My, maybe that's something we ought to consider. So, why is it interesting? If you've got the worksheet there, why is it interesting that the Medes are mentioned in Isaiah 13? Because if we accept a naturalistic philosophy, one would have expected the historian to put Persians. Writing without divine inspiration, writing without God's aid, an historian would have said Persians. And then there's this question, is it possible that Isaiah's remarks about the Medes and his own understanding is not necessarily a distant remark about historical events of 539 BC. Now here's an interesting point. Here's a very interesting point. When Isaiah or any of the other prophets and New Testament figures, whenever they predict, it does not always have to be the case that God is filling them in on all of the exhaustive details. So God may tell them Babylon is going to be judged, but that's all God says which may clue us in as to why in Isaiah 13 it is the Medes who are mentioned and not the Persians. If God had said the Persians are going to judge Babylon, I'm sure that Isaiah 13 would have said that. But what if God only revealed to Isaiah Babylon will be judged? What if God said it will be judged by the Medes? What if that's what God said? Which is true. The Medo-Persian Empire is a conjoined thing. But what? here's the question. What if God had not said a thing about the Persians? What if he only said something about the Medes? Well, now we have an explanation as to why the text says something about the Medes and the Persians go unnoticed. Hopefully you're following that. It's a very difficult argument to follow, and some of this is going to be very thorny. But take a look then at question two if you've got the worksheet. Is the mention of Babylon in Isaiah 21? Isaiah 21 mentions Babylon again. Is it a problem for the critical scholars? Could this text belong to Isaiah of Jerusalem even in their view?
This is a very difficult question for a couple of reasons, and I'm just going to briefly analyze it. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. You need to spend your own time in Isaiah 21 to get the force of what's going on in that text. But it looks to me, it looks to me like Isaiah 21 discusses events that are happening in Isaiah's own day of the 8th century. So we don't need to, or, or really early uh, 7th century, 8th or 7th century. It's right there at the breaking point. Sennacherib's invasion is taking place. You get the idea. Anyway, you need to do your own study in Isaiah 21, but here's the point. Isaiah is not making, it doesn't look like to me, a, a distant prediction about some futuristic event that's going to come upon Babylon years after his passing. No, it looks like to me that Isaiah is speaking of contemporary events, and so when analyzing Isaiah 21, it looks like this is not some prediction that's distant in the future. Isaiah is writing this as a contemporary of the events that are transpiring. So the question is, is it a problem for the critical scholars? No, of course not. Could this text belong to, a, to Isaiah of Jerusalem even in their view? Yes. Even the critical scholars generally go that way and they say Isaiah 21 looks authentic to Isaiah the 8th century prophet of Jerusalem. Okay, now here we get into a very interesting discussion, and I, I'm going to spend a little bit more time here, I do believe. We're talking about Isaiah 24 through 27. So let me pull up our drawing program here, and I'm going to show you what exactly, por what, the, what portion of the book we're in at this point. Uh, if you take a look at your screen, you should see the drawing program open. And we've analyzed just briefly. Uh, we've talked about the divisions of the book. We've talked about 1 through 6. And that's Isaiah's call. We've talked about 7 through 12, and that is the Syro Ephraimitic crisis. Ahaz is king, Hezekiah ends up taking over. Uh, but nonetheless, Judah and Israel are kind of at odds at this point, and Assyria is moving in. They're going to take off the Israeli captives, they're going to take them back to Assyria. All of that's happening. Uh, the date that we might throw out there just as a major date would be sometime in the early, early, uh, well, late, late 700s B.C. So 715, uh, 715, moving all the way from about 732, let's just go ahead and put this up there, about 735 to about 7, uh, depending on how far we want to stretch, let's just go 701. These events are taking place culminating in 701 and Sennacherib's major invasion of the land. So nonetheless, that's what 7 through 12 is dealing with. But as we get into 13 through 23, it's not so chronologically arranged, you can see. And in 13 through 23, we just see the oracles. These are the oracles against the nations. But now we enter into this section in 24 through 27. Everybody agrees. This is a major unit in the book. It is known as the little... <clears throat> apocalypse uh, apocalypse and I do not care really at this point to spend a major a major amount of time talking about apocalyptic literature or eschatological literature that's just not the intent of this course and there's a lot to be said about that maybe in a later course or a later book or something like that I'll say what I think needs to be said on that but nonetheless Isaiah's text is generally called here the little apocalypse and if you if you can't understand why that is give the literature a read and you'll see that this looks like it's into the world kind of material. It talks about resurrection. It talks about those kinds of things, bodies coming up out of tombs. And so naturally, people have called the attention to this. This looks like apocalyptic literature. And then because of that, all sorts of suggestions start to stem. So our question that we're going to be dealing with here, question three, starts to ask the question, while the majority of the liberal critical scholars, while the majority of the... Uh, liberal critical scholars insist that the concepts and the language of Isaiah 24 through 27 are both late. What is it that Hayes, a liberal critical scholar, documents in spite of those two arguments? How does this impact the question of authorship of that unit? Okay, so let's pull this back up and let's talk about what, what exactly the critical scholars are suggesting at this point. As we start to think about uh, let's open our drawing pad back up. As we start to think about, uh, as we start to think about Isaiah 24 through 27, why is it that the scholars are insisting it is a later text? Two major reasons. Number one, the concepts uh, 
And I'm just going to put one out here uh, off to the side as to one of those concepts that they really insist. This, in, this demonstrates that it's late. Resurrection. Resurrection. They say resurrection appears, so it does in Isaiah 26 and 19. And they say resurrection was not a concept that existed until far later. And they're going to even date it maybe as late as 2nd century BC. So resurrection to them is a very late concept, especially to some of those who really prefer a late dating. The second is maybe the style or the language. The language, the style and the language that is used. So let me give you an example that maybe we can relate to here in the modern day. What if I tell you about the Declaration of Independence? I don't tell you a date. I just tell you that, oh, it was about the same time as the Declaration of Independence. You know, oh, that was July 4th, 1776. So if I tell you in a document that I write, it was written around the same time as the, doc as the Declaration of Independence, you can't argue for it being a document that maybe would date all the way back to the 1400s, could you? 1100s. The Dark Ages, sometime around there. Uh, no, for me to argue for that, for you to argue for that, uh, that'd be much too early. The Declaration of Independence didn't come into existence until 70, 70, uh, 1776. So you would know, based on the date of that document and the fact that I'm making a reference to it, you would know that this other writing that speaks of the Declaration of Independence would have to be a later document. Well, that's the argument that they're raising on Isaiah 24 through 27. They're saying this unit of text, 24 through 27 of Isaiah, because it speaks of resurrection, and they say resurrection wasn't a concept until far later, Isaiah 24 through 27 must also be far later. And that's the same kind of language and style that they're insisting would demand a late date as well. Well, this is very interesting, and here's, here's something I want to remark about. As we think about uh, Isaiah 24 through 27, you would expect the critical scholars to be making this kind of argument. But there's a very interesting book that's just been come out in the last couple of years. It is called The Origins of Isaiah 24 through 27, Josiah's Festival Scroll for the Fall of Assyria. And it's written by Christopher B. Hayes, who is a professor at Fuller Theological Seminary. Now here's what's very interesting. Most of the critical scholars argue for a very late, very late date of this unit of text, 24 through 27. Christopher B. Hayes brings forth data in this book that shows that it was at least literature used, concepts that were used in Isaiah's day. Now this is very interesting. Why is it? Christopher B. Hayes is no friend to the fundamentalists. I'm not saying that to be rude, I'm just, and it's, he would probably say that very thing. He's not trying to argue for an authorship during the days of Isaiah. Look at what his book is called, Josiah's Festival Scroll for the Fall of Assyria. He's actually arguing for a date still. He's not a conservative scholar. He's still arguing for a date after Isaiah. But the points that he makes in this book, nonetheless, he is still showing that the language, the style, and the content, resurrection included, was actually being used even in Isaiah's day, and in some cases he documents texts that were used earlier. So for somebody to come along and say, well, resurrection wasn't a concept until after Isaiah's day, he shows that to be false. Here's another individual, J.J. M. Roberts, who was a professor at Princeton Theological Seminary. He is by no means a friend to the conservative fundamentalist view, but even he is admitting in a lot of cases in a lot of cases, the language that's being used doesn't necessarily have to be so late like these critical scholars would suggest. Here's my argument. If Hayes and Roberts and some of their suggestions that they're bringing forth some of this data, if some of that is correct, if that is correct, then maybe it is the case that Isaiah wrote these concepts, the styles, the language. Maybe it is the case that even Isaiah, the 8th century prophet of Jerusalem, really wrote these things. If not, why not? And so, what, so these, these arguments, let me tell you, John J. Collins, who's an Old Testament professor at Yale, uh, has made the argument, well, resurrection is a light concept. Is it? Is it so? Christopher B. Hayes brings forth documentation to show not necessarily true. So maybe we ought to rethink our position on the authorship of Isaiah 24 through 27. Now, here was the question. What is it that Hayes, a liberal critical scholar, documents in spite of those two arguments? He documents the usage in Isaiah's own day. Very helpful. And then, how does this impact the question of authorship 
of that unit, it at least, it at least suggests that there's still the possibility that Isaiah, the 8th century prophet, wrote it. And that answers our question number three. Okay, so question number four. Question number four. The majority of the scholars, critical scholars, struggle with identifying the city of Isaiah 24 through 27. What is a probable problem with their approach? How might this affect the later question of Isaiah 34, 35, which is usually treated as late? Okay, so what we need to do for a moment is we need to spend a, a brief amount of time talking about this city that appears in Isaiah 24 through 27. If you've got your Bible, I'm, I would encourage you to open it up. I'm going to make a couple of references here. I'm reading from Isaiah chapter 24, and I want to show you some of these references to the city. Uh, let's start in Isaiah chapter 24, and let's begin in 10 through 12. In this unit, I'll actually put it up here on the screen for us. Isaiah chapter um, 10, as uh, Isaiah 24 verses 10 through 12. Isaiah chapter 24 verses 10 through 12. In this discourse, you really need to be acquainted with Isaiah 24, 25, 26, 27 in order to know where we're headed in this argument. But in Isaiah 24, he's picturing this judgment, this cosmic judgment that's coming upon the world. And what he has in view in this unit, it pictures a worldwide judgment, but it's a worldwide judgment in Isaiah's day. So no, he's not talking about the end of the cosmos. That's just simply not Isaiah's intent, nor is it in Isaiah 34 or 35. And it ought to make us question then how the New Testament writers make usage of these kinds of texts. Yes, the New Testament writers are making usage of these kinds of texts. Maybe they're not insisting on a worldwide cosmic calamity either. So we need to at least give that some thought. But in Isaiah 24, in this section, the little apocalypse, look at this in 24.10. It says, The city of confusion is broken down. This is a destroyed wicked city. God is going to bring this judgment in the in the text, in the drama, in the vision. God is pictured as judging this city. And it says, every house is shut up that no man may come in. There is a crying for wine in the streets. All joy is darkened. The mirth of the land is gone. Judgment. All of this pictures, 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 not literalistically, it pictures judgment. Isaiah is presenting this oracle, a visionary kind of form of judgment. And so he says in 2412, in the city, what city is that? That's what we're talking about. In the city is left desolation. And the gate, the gate of the city, obviously, is smitten with destruction. In Isaiah 24, 10 through 12, we have this first reference to the city. Uh, I only I forgot to advance our, our point here, our PowerPoint. No worries. Isaiah 24, if you're looking at it in your text, it says in 24, 12, it says that that city and its gate are destroyed. And the city is left desolation, and the gate is smitten with destruction. What city is that? Let's keep in mind that at this point, I'm actually going to create a chart with you. And at this point, what we need to remember is that the city, at this juncture, is being judged. So we're asking about the identity of the city. And in 24, 10 through 12, it seems very obviously it is being judged or destroyed. Let's use the word destroyed. Now this is interesting. Where is our next reference to the city? Well, let's open up our Bible program again and we'll see what it has for us. If we look in Isaiah chapter 24, the next reference we have to this city is in Isaiah chapter 24 and verse 13, the very next passage. Now this is interesting. When thus it shall be in the midst of the, the land among the people, there shall be as the shaking of an olive tree and as the gleaning of grapes when the vintage is done. Well, what does that mean? Speaking of that city that has just been destroyed, just been leveled, now it says this, When thus it shall be in the midst of the land among the people, there shall be as the shaking of an olive tree and as the gleaning grapes when the vintage is done. It, what's the reference? What's the it? Look at the start of the text again. Isaiah 24 and verse 13. What's he saying when he says it? 
looks very clear to me that he's speaking of the city. When thus it shall be in the midst of the land among the people, there shall be the shaking of the, the olive tree, the gleaning of grapes. What's the it? It looks to me like he's talking about the city. So on the one hand, in 24, 10 through 12, he's just pictured this city as being destroyed, leveled, judged. The gate's going to be broken down. It's a city of confusion. But as we look at 24, 13, now it looks like it's going to be rebuilt. It's in the midst of the land among the people. They're going to be gleaning the grapes and the olive tree. What's going on? It looks like it's a reversal of what has just been talked about. So as we pull up our uh, chart again, this is interesting. Let's put up our chart again and look at what we have on the other hand. The city, same city, same city, so says 24, 10 through 13. The city that has just been leveled, here it's now pictured as not being destroyed, but maybe uh, rebuilt might be a good word. This city now is being rebuilt, and we see that in 24 and verse 13. Okay, well, let's go a little bit further with some of this. Where's our next reference to the city? Well, it comes to us from chapter 25, chapter 25, verses 2 and 3. And I'll put our Bible program back up, and you can see it on the screen there. Isaiah chapter 25, verses 2 and 3. Look at this. It says, For thou hast made of a city a city. What city? It seems to me, if we follow the context, it seems to me that the same city in 25, 26, 27 is the same city that we've just seen in 24. He's talking about the same kind of city in his entire line of argument. And so he says in 24, or 25, 2, For thou hast made of a city an heap, of a defense city, a ruin, a palace of strangers to be no city, so leveled, so judged that it's not even going to be a city, it shall never be built. Therefore shall the strong people glorify thee, the city of the terrible nations shall fear thee. Okay, what is he talking about here? Obviously, he's still got a city in view, but in this context, once again, he's talking about it being judged or destroyed. So as we put up on our chart once more, we've seen this picture of a destroyed, judged city. And so our reference, as we think about this destroyed, judged city, 25, 2, and 3, is just another reference to the city as being leveled or flattened or judged. Well, where does our next reference come from? It looks to me like it comes to us from 25, and verse 12, we have another reference to the city. Look at this. In chapter 25 and verse 12, we'll read this together. Isaiah chapter 25 and verse 12 says, And the fortress, if we follow the context, seems to me the fortress is the city. The fortress of the high fort of thy walls shall he bring down, lay low, and bring to the ground even to the dust seems the fortress, the high fort, the walls, it seems if we read the context, it seems to me like he's still speaking of the same thing. So we bring up once more, we bring up our drawing program, and let's put our chart up again. The city that's talked about in 2512 is a destroyed, judged, flattened city. But then there's another reference, and this is 26, 1 and 2. Look at this in Isaiah chapter 26, verses 1 and 2. Right now we're just analyzing the data. We'll make a, an interpretation of it here in just a moment. Isaiah 26, 1. In that day, what day? That's a phrase that's gotten some controversy. The day that's being talked about in the context. The day of this worldwide judgment. In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Look at this in Isaiah 26, and now in verse 2. Open ye the gates, that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. As we think about Isaiah 26, 1 and 2, he openly says, In that day, at the day of this cosmic judgment, as it's pictured in the drama in the vision, they'll say, the, the people will be singing, We have a strong city. So now we have a reference to a strong city. And some, some have said, well, Isaiah's conflicted. Some have said, well, he's got two different cities in view. Obviously, he's got two different cities in view. But let's, let's keep wrangling with this before we make our interpretation of how Isaiah is speaking of all of this. In Isaiah chapter 26, 
1 and 2, it is very clear. The city is being rebuilt. They're saying we have a strong city. They're singing the song of rejoicing in 26. Obviously coming out of the heels of 25, uh, which pictures that judgment and a, and, a, and a host of things. You need to read. You need to read the whole section to get the force of the argument that he's making here. But then we have another reference, and this comes to us from 26 and verse 5. I know this is a lot of readings. Bear with me, and then we'll try to make an, an argument from all of this. Uh, but in Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 5, look at what he says: For he bringeth down them that dwell on high. The lofty city, he layeth it low. He layeth it low even to the ground. He bringeth it even to the ground. He bringeth it even to the dust. You know where I'm headed with this. In Isaiah 26, 5, as we put up our uh, chart, as we pull that back up, you know that Isaiah 26, 5 is now speaking of the city once more, but it's speaking of it as being judged. And then as we look at there, are, there's one final reference to the city, and then we'll make it an interpretation of all of this. The final reference to this city comes to us from Isaiah chapter 27, the very last passage of the unit. Isaiah 27 and verse 13. What does he say here? And it shall come to pass in that day that the great trumpet shall be blown, and they shall come which were ready to perish in the land of of Assyria and the outcasts in the land of Egypt and shall worship the Lord in the holy mount at Jerusalem hmm okay okay this is the last reference to the city let's put our chart back up and let's make it let's try to sift through some of this as we put our chart back up we will now put our final reference to the city it's calling attention to it in 27 in verse 13, Jerusalem is going to be purged. It's going to be glorified. It's going to be bountiful. Let's try to sift through some of this. And this is only the city, by the way. This is only the city. Uh, there are several other things as you look through, as you look through Isaiah 24 through 27, where there's a contrast made. Um, on the one hand, you have a haughty people who are judged. They're flattened. They're leveled. But there are other people who are humbled, and so they're exalted. They're lifted up. You see the righteous people being lifted up. You see the unrighteous people being judged. You see this one city that's being rebuilt. You see this other city that's being destroyed. You see uh, God's people. You see Satan's people. It doesn't come out and say Satan's people explicitly, but you see God's people. You see Satan's people. You see exiles, but you also see people who stay in the in the homeland. And then you see this kind of thing, the uh, vineyard that's vindicated. It's going to be bountiful. It's going to be joyful. But then you see this other place that's going to be like a wilderness. All of this is a creating a contrast. It's a compare and a contrast between these two different elements that are that keep going on in this unit. What is Isaiah doing? And what is this city? Some people have said, well, the city is, and you can take a pick, it's Moab. Some have said that the city is actually two different cities. Hayes, Christopher B. Hayes, has a very interesting observation as he tries to make it fit to be Ramat Rahel, uh, which was a city over there just, just a little bit uh, beyond Jerusalem. The, the numerous suggestions don't help us. And it doesn't help us either that, hi, that the critical view will not allow Isaiah the prophet to have an imagination. Now that's what I want to argue for. Here's what I want to argue for. I want us to allow the prophets... To have an imagination. What if, what if Isaiah is presenting this city, and obviously on the one hand he speaks of it as being destroyed, but on the other hand he speaks of it as being rebuilt. What if he is speaking of the same city, but he is imagining two different elements about it? What if he is picturing Jerusalem on the one hand as being judged, but he pictures Jerusalem on the other hand as being rebuilt? rebuilt? What if he pictures this worldwide judgment? as being upon all the wicked, but he pictures the salvation that's being enacted as being upon all of the righteous. Maybe that's what he has in view. And even some of the critical scholars who don't like to allow that kind of thinking, like uh, William Holiday, even people like him, allow maybe he is speaking of an idealized kind of city. Idealized kind of city. I think that's what he's doing. So here's our question, and let's try to tie all of this together. The majority of the critical scholars struggle with identifying the city of Isaiah 24 through 27. 
You see, if they could find it to be some kind of city, maybe they could fit it to some major historical event. But it then asks, what is a probable problem with their approach? They are much too sterile, clinical, wooden. They will not allow Isaiah to paint some kind of dramatic visionary feature. And so in order for Isaiah to talk about this city, they must find an actual city in human history instead of allowing Isaiah to look off into like this distant kind of vision and just paint circumstances embodied within the city. Now I know that's a very lofty kind of argument, but then this raises the question, how might this affect the later question of Isaiah 34 and 35, which is usually treated as late? Here's my suggestion. Isaiah is picturing in Isaiah 34 and 35 also. Let's jump over there and maybe some of this will start to make sense. As we look at Isaiah chapter 34, some of the language that gets used, some of the language that gets used in this text, maybe my, it might sound familiar to you, but it may not sound familiar to you because of Isaiah 34. It says this in 34.4, and all the host of heaven shall be dissolved. What is that speaking of? What does it mean when it says all the host of heaven shall be dissolved? The heavens, the clouds, the stars, the cosmos. That's what he's got in view. But look at this. And the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. What are you thinking of as you think about this text? The heavens being rolled up as a scroll. And then it says this in Isaiah 34, 4, And all their hosts shall fall down. What does that mean? Talking about the stars, the cosmic bodies. They're being pictured as falling down. As the leaf falleth off from the vine, and as a falling fig from the fig tree. Now if you're thinking about what Isaiah is saying in 34, he is picturing, he is picturing Cosmic disturbance, the moon, the sun, the stars, the clouds, all of this is just being dissolved. It's fading out of existence. Yeah, 2 Peter 3 makes use of this kind of language. Maybe we ought to rethink 2 Peter 3. Yeah, Revelation 20 and 21 makes use of this kind of language. Maybe we ought to rethink our use of Revelation. Nonetheless, Isaiah is the first one to use this kind of speech Ah, not necessarily the first, but he's, he's the Old Testament text from which Peter and John are drawing. So as we read this in Isaiah 34, what does Isaiah have in view? And a lot of people scream out, oh, he's speaking in the end of the world. Well, yes, in the vision, in the text, in the oracle, you're thinking, you're seeing, you're imagining the end of the world. But now we need to go a step further and ask, what does that picture mean? Yes, Isaiah sees the end of the world. But in his context, what does the end of the world mean? Look at this in 34, in verse 5. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. To take a very literalistic interpretation of verse 4, I think would be very problematic, seeing as a literalistic interpretation of 34, 5 would be nonsense. He says, my sword shall be bathed in heaven. The picture of the end of the world just speaks of judgment. It's just a picture for judgment. And then to make it more clear, he says, Behold, it, that sword, and all of the cosmic destruction shall come down upon Idumea, Edom. He is picturing the fall of Edom and upon the people of my curse to judgment. He's speaking of the judgment of Edom. In fact, he goes on in 34.6, the sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It's made fat with fatness. It says, And with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams, for the Lord hath a, look at this, the Lord hath a uh, sacrifice in Basra, one of Edom's capital cities, and a great slaughter in the land of Idumea. As it is in Isaiah 24 through 27, so it is in Isaiah 34 and 35. God has singled out Edom or Moab or in some other context he might select Egypt or Assyria and he selects that, that nation or that land as a symbol for the entire world in Isaiah's day. So when Isaiah speaks about the Lord rolling up the heavens and the earth and the stars fading out of existence, the moon being turned to blood and that sort of speech, he's not speaking about a literalistic expulsion of the cosmos. He is speaking about a judgment upon the oppressor of the day.
That's what Isaiah 34 is getting at. So yes, we need to rethink how Peter uses it, and yes, we need to rethink how John uses it. But in Isaiah 34, if he can imagine in the prophetic vision, if Isaiah can imagine a cosmic disturbance like this, and all it speaks about is judgment upon the idealized villain of the day, maybe the historical scholars, the critical historical scholars, are completely wrong to insist on such a literalistic, sterile, clinical, wooden view of Isaiah's text. In fact, here's something that's interesting. You just read with me from Isaiah 34, where it says the earth is going to get blown out of existence. True? True? If that's literal, what are we supposed to make out of Isaiah 34, just a few verses down where it says this? Well, let's actually get verse 8, 34, 8. For it, this judgment upon Edom, is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. Now he says in 34, 9, and the streams thereof, the streams thereof, shall be filled or turned into pitch, and the dust thereof into brimstone, and the land thereof shall become burning pitch. It, this fire, shall not be quenched night nor day. And he says in 34:10, the smoke thereof shall go up forever. From generation to generation it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. Oh, that suits the people who want to make this a very literalistic picture of the end of the world. Look, so it says in 34.4, the heavens and earth are going to pass away. So it says in 34.9 and 10, the day of the Lord's judgment will be where fire comes upon the world. It's going to turn everything into pitch and nothing will exist. And the, the fire is going to burn forever and ever. And the literalist, or even some of our friends uh, that we're very close to, insist this is a picture of the end of the cosmos. Hardly. Hardly. The text just came out and told us that it's upon Basra and Edumea. So you can't then argue that it's a literal picture of the end of the world. But let's grant the argument that it is. Here's a question then. If it's more than just a picture, if it's an actual depiction of the final end of human history, what do we make of 3411? But the cormorant and the bittern shall possess it. Possess what? The land. The land. The owl also and the raven shall dwell in it. Hmm. And he shall stretch out, he shall stretch out upon it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. They shall call the nobles thereof to the kingdom, but none shall be there. And all her princes shall be nothing. Now watch 13, 34, 13. And thorns shall come up in her palaces nettles and brambles in the fortresses thereof, and it shall be an habitation of dragons and a court for owls. Okay, if we take a very literalistic view where the heavens and earth are completely shattered and fire overtakes the entire cosmos forever and ever, literally, and we take all of this as a literal picture, my question is this. The land has just been obliterated, so how is it now going to be possessed by the owls and the dragons, whatever these animals are, in the picture, in the oracle? How then, if the world doesn't even exist, can this city, this place, these palaces, be turned into a desolation, but now it's actually overrun by dragons and owls and whatever animals that are there? 14, the wild beasts of the desert will also overtake, meet with the wild. How can these individuals, these these animals, overtake the land if the land doesn't even exist because it's speaking of the end of the world? That's my question. Here's the point. Along with the historical critical scholars, some of us have been wrong for insisting on this as being a literal picture of the end of the world. It's not. Isaiah's already told us that it speaks about a judgment upon Idumea and Basra, a capital city of Edom. And then, furthermore, you've got the conflict between if the world doesn't exist anymore, how can the world now be pictured as a desolation but yet a habitation for these wild beasts? The point is this. Isaiah is picturing. He's not insisting on a literalistic interpretation. Neither is Peter in 2 Peter 3. Neither is John in the book of Revelation. These individuals are drawing on the visionary prototype as set forth by Isaiah. And so when Isaiah speaks about this kind of thing, he's picturing the calamity upon the contextual oppressor or villain. The historical literal scholars are, or the historical critical scholars are still looking for a historical event in the past that Isaiah could associate this event with. 
And they're not allowing him to be a creative speaker, an imaginary speaker. They're not allowing that kind of speech. And so as we think about Isaiah's text, we've got to allow him to be a little bit more imaginative than the liberal critical scholars are allowing. Isaiah 24 through 27 and 34 through 35 are two of those chapters where the critical scholars have a fit about what Isaiah is speaking of. And I'm insisting that Isaiah, the 8th century prophet of Jerusalem, could write it, did write it, and that what he's doing is not drawing out historical events for us, but that he's picturing them in ideal imagery. And that's what's going on in Isaiah's text. Did Isaiah, the 8th century prophet, write these things? Yes. Yes, he's not predicting these things literally, but he's drawing up a picture of judgment and speaking that against villains that existed in his own day. So we don't need to find some historical event to which Isaiah or some late historian could write this in retrospect. That's not the point of the text. It's just simply not the point of the text. Isaiah is looking ahead, but he's writing this in some kind of vision in advance. He's idealizing and he's imagining. That sometimes how the prophet spake. What did the Hebrews writer say? Uh, Hebrews 1.1 1, 1, God, who at sundry times and diverse manner spake in time past uh, to the fathers by the prophets. Different manners. Various ways. The Lord didn't always predict everything in a literalistic item for item view. And Isaiah is certainly not. In Isaiah 24 through 27 and Isaiah 34 and 35. We need to catch that point and catch the fact that Isaiah could imagine things rather than insist on a literalistic interpretation or an item-for-item item prediction. He is prophesying, but we need to understand how it is that he's doing that. Maybe some of this is touched on in the former lecture, number three, prediction. Number five, what are three arguments that might suggest an early date of the authorship of Isaiah 24 through 27 from Isaiah of Jerusalem? This is very interesting. So, so let's say that you are one of those literal, critical, historical scholars and you like the wooden, sterile, clinical reading of the text. There are a couple of things in Isaiah 24 through 27 even that we've got to give a second glance. In Isaiah chapter 24 through 27, it is worth noting. I'm going to put these three things up in our uh, drawing program so we can go ahead and list them out together. The first thing that is very interesting, the first thing that is very interesting is that Babylon, Babylon is never listed. In Isaiah 24 through 27, Babylon is never mentioned in the unit. Isaiah 24 through 27, you would expect if it were some late text, even if it were by some late editor who's trying to make it look like it was actually written by Isaiah, you would still expect if it were written by a late like a, by a late editor or by a late author, you would still expect Babylon to be mentioned. Why is Babylon not mentioned? Maybe, just a suggestion, maybe it's because it was an early text. Second reason, if you look through Isaiah 24 through 27, there's a second thing that's very peculiar, and that's that Assyria and Egypt both are listed. And that comes to us in 27, 13. Give that a read in your own time. Isaiah 27, 13 explicitly mentions Assyria and Egypt by name. So while Babylon is not listed at any point in the unit, Assyria and Egypt, who were the villains of the 8th and 7th centuries, they are listed. Peculiar, isn't it? Maybe it's because it's a text that's written by Isaiah in his own day, and he's seeing all of this transpiring in his own day, but he also has an imagination and writes creatively about this worldwide calamity that would come in Isaiah 24 through 27, and he's using pictures to depict that rather than an item for item historical association. And then a third thing that's worth noting is that pre exilic immoralities are listed. So the sins are, here's the word, early. The sins that are listed are early. If you look in Isaiah chapter 27 and verse 9, I'm just going to read this to us. By this, therefore, shall the iniquity of Jacob be purged. This is all the fruit to take away his sin. When he makes all the stones of the altar as chalk stones that are beaten in sunder, the groves and images shall not stand up. These sins with the groves and the images, 
and the high places were pre-exilic sins. So if this is written by some light editor, somebody could say, oh, well, he's putting that in there because he's trying to pose as Isaiah, perhaps. Or maybe it's actually written by Isaiah about these sins that actually existed in Isaiah's day and he was actually facing in his own era. So the three points that are very interesting about Isaiah 24 through 27, I know the critical scholars appeal, well, it says something about resurrection, which is a, a very late concept. We've already shown that's not necessarily the case. Christopher B. Hayes, even a critical scholar, says that's not necessarily the case and gives documentation as to where those concepts, the languages, and the style appear earlier and even in Isaiah's own day. So what argument, again, is there to say that 24 through 27 must be later than Isaiah? We know of none. I know of none. I know of not a single argument that forces us to believe that it was written later than Isaiah's day. Yet, as you look at your screen, there are three arguments right there that may suggest that Isaiah actually wrote the text. Babylon's not listed, Assyria and Egypt are the villains in the text, and the sins that are mentioned are actually earlier sins in Isaiah's own day. It starts to look, as we sift through some of this data, it starts to look like maybe Isaiah 24 through 27 and Isaiah 34 and 35 also are actually written by Isaiah, the 8th century prophet of Jerusalem. Number six, and we've got to, we've got to move off this very quickly. Number six, uh, as we look at number six, because Cyrus is mentioned by name, because Cyrus is mentioned by name in Isaiah 40 through 55, the critical scholars usually treat the section as written by a contemporary of his. What does Aulus, Oswald T. Aulus, suggest about the unit to suggest that it must have been written as a piece that predicted future events? How do the possible usual suggestions of the scholars only make Aulus's argument stronger and make their problem greater? We're hurting for time here, so we've got to make this argument very quickly. I'm going to pull up our Bible program, and we'll read this rather quickly. Uh, if you take a look at the screen, you should be able to see the Bible program. And we're going to start in Isaiah uh, 44 and verse 20, uh, I think it's 24, Isaiah 44, 24. Uh, yes. Okay. As you take a look at this on the screen, it says, Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb. Watch this. I am the Lord that maketh all things. When did that happen? It's a past event, right? Catch note of this. Take note of this. Past event number one. He made all things. I am the Lord that stretcheth forth the heavens alone. When did he do that? In the past, right? He stretched forth the heavens alone. He says this. I am the Lord that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. When did he do that? In the past. All three things mentioned in 4424 are past events. He made all things. He stretched forth the heavens. He spread abroad the earth. Past events, three things. Notice this in 25. I am the Lord that frustrateth the tokens of the liars and maketh diviners. Look at this, he's doubling up. And maketh diviners mad. When did the Lord frustrate the tokens of the liars and make diviners mad? Present tense, he's still doing it. That's what, the, that's what the language is reflecting. So argues Oswald T. Aulis. I am the Lord that turneth wise men backward, and he's going to double up, and maketh their knowledge foolish. He's not just giving one argument. Now he's actually, every argument he's making, he's adding on a second little part to it. So he says, I am also the Lord that turneth wise men backward, and maketh their knowledge foolish. And then a third thing, I am the Lord that Confirmeth the word of his servant, and he doubles up again on this third point, and performeth the counsel of his messengers. Okay, let's stop here for a moment, and we're going to jump over to our uh, program, our, our writing program. Look at this. What we have seen up to this point, what we have seen is that in Isaiah 44, and verse 24, we have how many things mentioned? Three. And those three things are all past. He made all things. You get the idea. He spread forth the heavens, spread forth the earth, that sort of thing. Three things, and those are in the past. Now we have mention in 4425, we're getting mention of three things, and they are taking place in the present. And he's not just giving three. He's actually uh, going a little bit further than that. He says one thing, but then he doubles it up. 
So it's actually three things, but he amends them with a second little phrase on each one. So three things, but they're a little bit longer. Now look at what he does. We've seen three things that God has done in the past, three things that he's still presently doing. And now look at the text as we jump back to our Bible program. Look at this in Isaiah 44 and verse uh, 26 that confirms the, conform, that confirms the word of his servant and performs the counsel of his messengers that says to Jerusalem, catch this, you shall be inhabited. When's that going to take place? Future tense. Says to the cities of Judah, you shall be built. And he says, and I will raise up the decayed places. I will raise up future tense thereof that says to the deep be dry and I will dry up thy rivers future tense that says of Cyrus he is my shepherd he shall perform future tense all my pleasure even saying to Jerusalem thou shalt be built and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid you're going to have to get the book and look at the book in order to see the argument that's being made here um, but as I'm, as I'm making this argument, look, let's look at our chart once more. As we start to look at the end of the prophetic poem, Oswald Aulis's argument is this. In the last part, in 44, 26 through 28, he gives us mention of three things which are basically tripled, but it even gets an alert that the last part is extraordinarily future. You've got to see this section in the book where I quote Aulis and make his argument in a very simplified form. The point is this, when Cyrus is spoken of, he's spoken of as being a future figure. So, as we think about this text, the scholars, what can they say? They can do a couple of things. Well, Cyrus is mentioned. Isaiah can't predictively prophesy him. Maybe the name Cyrus, maybe the name Cyrus is a light gloss. Hmm. Maybe, but then you're going to disrupt the structure of the poem, as points out Oswald Aulis. He's going to say, no, 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 no. Look at this. The threes, you can't disrupt that. If you disrupt the form of the poem, you're going to disrupt this entire structure. The prophetic poem would not make sense. It wouldn't have been written that way. So if you just say that the name Cyrus is a light gloss, it doesn't look, it, it, would, it, it would destroy the structure of the poem. Well, maybe then this. Maybe the scholars can say, oh, this entire thing here, this entire poem is actually a late gloss. Oswald Aulis's argument is this. No, because in the section in 40 through 48, you have references all over the place in chapters 41. You've got them in chapter 44. You've got them in chapter 45. You've got a reference in chapter 46. And he makes the point that all of this climaxes, the entire section, 41 builds, 44 builds, 43 even builds, into the naming of this figure, Cyrus. He's finally named. He comes back off and drops off in 45, 46. You've got to see the argument as I, pray, as I make it from Oswald Aulis' influence in the book. The point is this. You take away the prophetic poem, 44, 24 through 28. You take that out. The rest of this unit now starts to collide. It starts to fall. It starts to dissolve. And so the best the scholars can do is say, well, 40 through 48, the entire thing is a light gloss. No, no, now you've disrupted the entire historical setting of those books. The critical scholars can't go with that. No, it mentions Cyrus. They date all of this based on historical notations. They've got to say now Cyrus is mentioned. So what do they have to say? It's written by a contemporary of Cyrus. It can't be somebody far later. Otherwise, they're not going to be able to date any of the material of the Bible. Because Cyrus is mentioned, they've got to date him as a contemporary. Here's the point. The entire structure of the poem insists that Cyrus is a futuristic figure. The entire structure of the poem insists that, I, that Cyrus is a futuristic figure. Here's what we think. Here's what the text would su suggest. Here's what your Bible, a fundamental reading of your Bible, would suggest. Isaiah back here in the 8th century, by God's miraculous hand, could predict a figure here in the 6th century named Cyrus. Looking in advance, God supernaturally gives Isaiah the power to predict Cyrus. But one says, no, 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 here's the, uh, here's the real thing. Here's what's really taking place. In Isaiah chapter 45, 44 and 45, 
they're going to say Cyrus has not yet taken Jerusalem. That's why he's presented as a futuristic figure. But it's right. he's writing at the very same time. So whoever this is that's writing, maybe Deutero-Isaiah, maybe Trito-Isaiah, maybe some other editor or author out of one of these quote-unquote schools, you know the view now, don't you? Cyrus hasn't yet accomplished this, but they write at the time where he's at the peak of his power and he's about to do it. Now this leads us into question seven, a good question that comes to us from Homer Haley. Here's a good question. As we think about Cyrus and how he's mentioned in 40 through 55, and that's one of their big arguments. If Cyrus is mentioned by name, predictive prophecy is not real, you know that it had to be written by some late author. Here's Homer Haley's question. It comes to us from our book. I'm going to just read this part to you and follow the argument very well. It's on page 83. Listen to Homer Haley's question. Even if Cyrus had already taken Babylon, 539, when the prophecy was spoken, how could one know that he would allow the Jews to return to Jerusalem and that Jerusalem would be rebuilt? You see, here's the point. Somebody says, the critical scholar says, well, you see, Cyrus has already, he has already conquered Babylon. Uh, he's already conquered Babylon at the time of Isaiah's writing in chapter 44. That's already happened. But there's a futuristic, so this is all a past thing. He's already conquered Babylon. But they say in Isaiah 44 and 45, the rebuilding, of course, wouldn't take place in 539. In 539, the rebuilding and the sending them back home didn't take place at that very time. And so Homer Haley's question is very fitting as he says, if this is future, how would this other author who's writing at the time of Cyrus, remember 539, is so, there, so we're told he's writing at the same time as Cyrus is at the peak of his power. How can he know by intuition? How could he know to put Isaiah 44, 28, where they're going back home, the Jews are, and they're going to rebuild Jerusalem. Could somebody just know that through intuition? Haley's point stands secure. No. Somebody says, well, that's a late gloss. Now you disrupt the structure of the poem. Get the book. Give this a read. Let's draw a conclusion as to what we've learned in this episode. And this one was difficult. This might be probably, uh, it might very well be the most difficult episode in the entire installment about the composition of Isaiah. But nonetheless, Let's talk about a summation of what have we seen. There are a couple of major texts in the book of Isaiah that create problems, so we're told, for you and me, conservative Bible students. But as we look at Isaiah chapter 13, as we look at Isaiah 13, 24 through 27, and then the unit of Isaiah 40 through 48 that talks about Cyrus, as we start to look at some of these things, we start to see maybe the data supports an authorship of Isaiah, the 8th century prophet of Jerusalem. Maybe the data's on our side, and maybe those who actually have the problem are not the fundamentalists, but maybe the problems are actually for the critical scholars. Study up on these things, get the book, give it a read. There's a lot more data that I'm not able to present because of various reasons that you might find in the book. Give some of those pages, especially around 83, give those pages a read and look at the arguments that are set forth. Maybe we ought to allow Isaiah, the 8th century prophet, to be a little more imaginative, and maybe we ought to allow God, a supernatural God, to give miraculous predictive prophecy. Until next time, hopefully you're learning about the book of Isaiah, hopefully you're learning about the authorship of it, and maybe you've started to have your faith strengthened, because we believe in an almighty and very much a supernaturalistic Jehovah God. Until next time, may God richly always bless you to his glory.